The interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress. The veteran's name is Wilbur James Mahoney. They were born on February 29, 1929 and served during the Korean War and Cold War. He achieved the rank of Captain 06. We are recording this on November 26, 2013. I'm Caleb Hawkins and I'm conducting the interview. No relation. So what is it that made you decide to actually join the Navy? Basically, it was to get to GI Bill. The GI Bill was running out at the end of 1946, and so I enlisted before I finished high school so that I'd be eligible for the GI Bill. Didn't use it till I came to Clemson, and uh, used it to get a PhD here. So um, I guess your first kind of feelings and thoughts as you were joining, um, I know this is kind of obviously wrapping up uh, the end of World War II, and uh, everyone had a strong sense of patriotism and whatnot. Um, for you, what did joining really kind of mean and feel like at that time? Well, I was proud to do it. I was proud to be in the Navy rather than another service, and I don't know why, but I did. Uh, that appealed to me. The other thing was that they had a program called the Eddy Program at that point, where they were educating electronic technicians. You had to take a test and pass the test. So I was eligible for the electronic technician program, which was a year-long school. First six months at Great Lakes and the second six months in Washington, D.C. at the Naval Research Lab in uh, electronics, radar, Loran, uh, were all blooming at that point and uh, used uh, vacuum tube technology and uh, <clears throat> The, the more advanced things that are available right now uh, would be way beyond me, but at that time it was a challenge to be an electronic technician. And at the conclusion of the school in Washington, D.C. at the Naval Research Lab, uh, we decided to go to submarines. And probably the main reason for that was it was exciting and it was also higher pay and I can remember sitting with no clothes on during an ent entry exam to the submarine school and sitting in an office not unlike this without any clothes on and the psychologist says, why do you want to get in submarines? And so I told him, for two reasons, I want to get more pay and also have time to study so that I can complete my high school education and, and get in, into college. So I guess, um, kind of stepping back a little bit, where uh, did you go for basic and uh... Went to boot camp <clears throat> at Great Lakes, Illinois. Okay. I think at that time they had boot camps at Bainbridge, Maryland and also in San Diego. But I remember getting on a train by myself and, and going to be inducted at Great Lakes. And the first thing that happens to you is that you dump all your civilian clothes in a bag and ship them home. And they issue you all new duds and uh, uniforms and all the rest of that kind of thing. And it goes with it, so they really move you into a transition to the Navy. So um, from there, you said that you actually went and uh, began studying, um, or is there a time between where you, uh, I guess, kind of did other things, or how, how exactly was the time went? Well, the transition for boot camp, which was in December of 1946, to entry into electronic school in January was just a matter of weeks. And so there was some leave in there, I went home to Denver, and uh, came back and served in the galley for three weeks, I can remember, while we waited to be inducted into the school. The school was right there at Great Lakes first six months, and then in the summer, in July, we were transferred to Washington, D.C., where the Naval Research Lab is, and the last six months of the school was there, and finished that in de December of 47, and went from there again to submarines, I mean, went to submarine school for the first time, and it was a three-month period as compared to the officer's 
program, which is six. But the three-month period went from January through the end of March. In the middle of that school, on a February night, we were routed out of the barracks and put on the end of a fire hose. The uh, Commander Submarine Force Atlantic Fleet Headquarters building was burning down. And they mustered all the students and everybody out to fight the fire. And so at three or four o'clock in the morning, I'm waiting in two feet of snow on the end of a fire hose trying to put that fire out. And uh, so that was probably the only exciting thing other than surviving up and down hatches and things like that in submarines, which was a little foreign to you at that time. But we did uh, finish the submarine school was transferred then to the USS Tilefish, which was then stationed in Hawaii. And uh, so to get there, we went to Mare Island Naval Shipyard. Mare Island Naval Base is really what it was at the time, and was in a holding period for about three weeks, and then we got on a troop transport, and were, my first time at sea was on a troop transport going from San Francisco to Hawaii. And they put us on lookout duty and had to crawl up that mast and get up on top of that mast and back and forth. The Pacific is, it's called Pacific, but it's not very passive. It's usually very rough. And uh, that's my first experience with seasickness. And so I got to Hawaii and got on the submarine, but my pay record didn't catch up with me at that point, so I couldn't do anything but play basketball on the base. And so rank insignia on my white uniforms, which I hadn't worn too much up to that point, but in Hawaii, uh, whites were the order of the day. So I can remember doing that, learning how to shine shoes. The, the Filipino stewards that were aboard the ship to serve the officers principally, taught me how to shine shoes. That was, that was pretty good, I remember that. Anyway, we came back to go into overhaul uh, after a time at sea. Um, we spent some time in overhaul. And in the overhaul at Mare Island for the ship, I was, as an electronic technician, I thought I was going to be working on electronics. I was shipping paint in the superstructure and scraping asphalt and things like that. And they came up with the idea that they could take, you could take a test to go to the prep school at Bainbridge and prepare to go to the Naval Academy. And so I said, well, that's a day away from chip and paint. I'll go up and take the test. So we did and passed the test and were sent to the uh, school at Bainbridge, Maryland which is right along Highway 95 now if you go across the Susquehanna River on I-95 and look to your left, you can see a tower up there. And that tower was the home tower for the Bainbridge-based prep school for the Naval Academy. That prep school is now at Newport, uh, Connecticut, but Rhode Island, Newport, Rhode Island. So anyway, uh, we went, went to prep school and was able to score high enough on what was then the Naval Academy entrance exam to be one of the 90 people that are selected from the fleet to go to the Naval Academy every year. And I think they select 90 from the regular Navy and 90 from the Reserve Navy. So about 400 of those students in the prep school made it into the Naval Academy one way or the other. Many on congressional appointments and other appointments. But I was appointed from the fleet. I finished the Naval Academy in four years and uh, was one of the top stripers, they call it, my senior year at the Naval Academy. I roomed with the top stripers. Uh, a fellow named Carl Trost, who later became Chief of Naval Operations. And I was Deputy Commander of the Corps of Midshipmen and uh, the Brigade, the Brigade of Midshipmen. So I succeeded in, in 
graduating number 10 out of a class of 923. Uh, and we reasonably proud of that and went immediately to the boxer. And that's how I got on the boxer. So we went on leave and came to San Francisco and were shipped out again on another troop transport. To go to Japan, we landed in, Co in I think it was Kobe, Japan, we moored there and then by train we went to an air base, the name of which I don't remember, and we were flown to Korea. And we were sitting in a holding area on the coast of Korea waiting to be flown to the, the, the ship and the war ended. Uh, the armistice was signed, it was in August of 1953. So I got on the boxer by landing on the deck um, in what was a converted Avenger torpedo bomber that carried four of us out there and uh, four Naval Academy graduates reported at the same time. On the boxer I had three jobs. One of them was signal officer, the other one was assistant navigator and when they found out I put in for postgraduate school, I immediately got assigned to the engineering department. And so I was made the A division officer, and the A division officer owned everything that nobody else owned, and all the ventilation systems. We owned the boats, we owned uh, all the bilge pumps, and emergency generators, and all the miscellaneous engineering equipment on the ship and uh, that I learned a lot in that. And one of the things I learned was when you test emergency generators, test them under load. Don't be satisfied to know that they'll run. You need to know that they'll carry the load because we were moving from a dry dock in San Francisco Bay Naval Shipyard, which is now closed, uh, in there for a three months overhaul period and we were moving from the dry dock to pier side and of course you have to disconnect all the power and rather than light off the boilers and, <clears throat> and run the steam generators you would use the diesel we had an emergency diesel at each end of the ship that ostensibly would carry the load but that night they wouldn't you could just light them off and they would not load up, they'd just die. And uh, when we did finally get around and moved the ship with battle lanterns, basically, finally got around and reported the bridge and we got a talking to from the captain. It took us about a week to figure out that <clears throat> we had a vent valve closed on the feed line to the injectors and so it put some back pressure on a on the injectors would not let them to their full full throw. And so while it would run and idle, it would not carry the load. And so it was just a matter of opening two valves uh, to relieve that pressure and uh, a vent valve on the overflow tank. So uh, that's one of the lessons I learned on the boxer. But there were others I learned too. But. Uh, Anyway, I spent two years on the boxer and had put in for postgraduate school. I went to Webb Institute. They entered, at that time they were running four naval officers into um, a program that yielded <clears throat> a master's degree in naval architecture and um, it ultimately also a bachelor's degree in marine engineering. So I got two degrees from those three years and went from there again back to sub-school and uh, actually started sub-school in, in July of 1958 <clears throat> before I actually uh, had graduated from Webb. I had to go from, oh, after a week at sub-school, go back down to Webb and, and get the diploma. And my wife and her parents were instrumental in our move and moved into quarters at the submarine school. And that's a six-month program. From there we went to San Diego 
in, in at the end of that year, December 58, reported in 59 to the Pomadon. And so I was on the Pomadon until leaving in 1960 to go across country. My wife was eight months pregnant when we made that trip. So our youngest son was born in Portsmouth uh, a month after we arrived there. And we worked during that period with five other naval officers who were assigned to a school that was called nuclear familiarization. And we were told that we were to teach ourselves, six of us, in court, in, in building situation not unlike this office. So we got all the books we could on how the submarines were built and what what made them go. They were building at that time the USS Thresher, SSN 593, which if you remember your history, in 1963, in August, it was lost at sea. 200 miles east of Cape Cod, with uh, 129 people aboard, many of whom were my friends. And men I was working with in that nuclear familiarization school, there were six of us. And as we had gone through the process of trying to learn what this was all about by going to crew lectures and studying books and lecturing to each other on how the hull was designed and what the propulsion plant consisted of and the hydraulic system, air system. And we were teaching our, each, each of us about the ship. They put us in charge of testing the ship. And so we were assigned two to the machinery sections, non-nuclear machinery sections, two to the pipe the hydraulic and and high pressure air systems and I was with another fellow named Phil Allen and we were again in the auxiliary business. We had everything else that worked uh, under the auspices of these other four officers and so we tested the battery, we tested the battery ventilation, we tested the tank level indication, the periscopes going up and down, the <coughs> diesel engine diesel energy generator, uh, any auxiliary equipment which wasn't a part of either the air system, hydraulic system, or the machinery, main machinery. And so actually the thresher made it to, to, to sea successfully. I was assigned as the investigating officer for a silver braze joint failure and uh, a small one-inch line carried away and sprayed high pressure seawater all over the works. And in retrospect, the Navy should have really paid attention to that more than we did. Because silver brazing was an art at that time and not a science. And uh, what had happened in that joint, the uh, brazier had left the silver brazing ring out of the groove that is in the boss on the line and the idea is that you heat that up to the point that that silver brazing ring melts and flows out so you can see a fillet around the joint and that was the extent of the quality control that existed at that point and so uh, whoever did it face fed that fillet to make it look as though it had been uh, done well but it wasn't. So they were disciplined as a result of my investigation, but I don't think the Navy shook the trees well enough at that point. And so the thresher went to sea, this is a diversion from my career, and operated well for another year. And the only incident that I can recall is that they were tied up in Puerto Rico um, and shut down the reactor and we're running on the diesel and the diesel engine cooling pump failed and so the diesel couldn't be used 
and they didn't have enough power in the battery to start the reactor, which is what it's supposed to be. Every nuclear submarine has a 126 cell battery that produces enough power, if it's fully charged, to start the reactor. And uh, they had bled that, that down far enough so it wouldn't work, and so they had to bring another diesel electric submarine alongside and provide short power to the thresher. But anyway, I went back into an overhaul at Portsmouth in 1962, after it operated well for a year. And then at the end of that, what they call post-shakedown availability, the thresher left on a Sunday and went to sea. And the next Monday morning, I think it was, I've forgotten the date, but I think it's like April 14th, 1963. It was at sea conducting its first really deep dive since the availability. And what we think is that a silver brazy joint carried away. It could have been a big one, it could have been a small one. But anyway, the reactor was scrammed, lost propulsion, and started to sink, and they didn't have enough capacity in the primidane brain pumps and the print on the ship to overcome the increase in weight that is represented by the increase in pressure as you sink. Um, and so in a matter of five minutes the ship sank through its crush depth and went to the bottom in 8,500 feet of water. That's a mile and a half deep and of course it took them six, eight months to find it and they had to use the Trieste to find it. But I lost Two of the people I had gone to the school was on that ship. If I had stayed in Portsmouth, I would have been aboard that. And we were building the second and third ship of the class. The Thresher class had 13 ships in it. And so the Thresher was number one. And at Mare Island, we had number two and number three. The permit and the plunger. And I was the planning and estimating superintendent for those two ships, which meant I was the guy in charge of the money and the guy in charge of customer relations and making sure things happened right. And on the third sea trial, I think, it may have been the second, we had the Board of Inspection and Survey aboard to accept the ship. And it seems a little odd because we're Navy and the Navy that accepts it, you know, we're giving the ship over to the operators. That's basically what we're doing. We built a ship there at Mare Island, and um, so on the second or third sea trial, we were off the coast of San Francisco, and it turns out we were not deep enough to be free from getting hit, but and too too deep to see with the periscope and see what was going on. But I was in charge of a test crew there as well, and. I was trading off with another senior lieutenant commander who had the day shift and I got the night shift. So I was going to be on from 12 to uh, 4 basically, uh, monitoring the testing that was going on and directing the shipyard people who were taking the data. Have you got time to talk to me this morning? No, we're good. We're good. Yeah. But anyway, uh, I decided to crawl into a clean rack because I rarely do that on a submarine. Took my clothes off, crawled in with the skivvies. And at 11 o'clock, uh, we had a big bang, huge bang. And ship shook, and I woke up to the fact that the engineering officer was going through the ship looking in lockers, trying to figure out what the damage might be and what, what happened. And so I got dressed in a hurry and I was crawling up the ladder. Our birthing space was right below the control room and as I stuck my head up above the level of the control room I could see the captain wrapped around the periscope as they do in the movies and he said, my God, it's a carrier. And it turned out to be the Hawaiian citizen that we would put a 40-foot hole in the bottom of the ship with the sail on top of the submarine. If we'd have been shallower, that might have been very serious for the submarine, but about all it did is wreck the top of the sail. The sail is a 
kind of fin-like thing that sticks up on the submarine and from which they con the ship on the surface. Couldn't get up there to con the ship. Had to bring the ship back in by looking through the periscope. Had two periscopes, one of them was banged up and the other one was operable. And so they brought the ship in. And uh, that was kind of exciting when you think about it. I feel like having a prayer meeting after that. But uh, uh, was at Mare Island for three years and we built the permit and the plunger. The two, number two and number three ships in that class. And I can remember being at sea before Thresher went down in those ships. And as they run a deep dive, the ship goes down a certain number of feet and then they stop at that level and operate all the valves, make sure that nothing's binding up. They go down and down and down until they get to deep depth. Or called the test depth, which is the deepest. It's a, they'll let, let them dive. That that depth is two thirds of the crush depth. In other words, if you go down another third, uh, the ship will crush. And the thresher actually, as I say, crushed in about five minutes going through its crush depth. And that instituted a subsafe program, which did a lot of things. The main thing it did was to improve the main ballast tank blow system, such that now submarines have an emergency main ballast tank blow system, which they exercise quarterly. And you've probably seen pictures of the submarines with their bow coming up uh, in a very dramatic fashion. Well, <clears throat> I, I was, when I left Mare Island, you know, after three years there, I went on the staff of Commander Submarine Force Pacific Fleet, and we were developing this subsafe program at that point. And so uh, I was able to give that little talk I just gave you in more detail to the prospective commanding officers of new COs that were coming out to take over the ships and the submarines in the Pacific Fleet. And so that speech was intended to be sure they understood what had happened in order to avoid any future cases. And um, as a part of that, the David Taylor Model Mason was uh, assigned to uh, investigate the use of the main ballast tank blow system. And the reason for it was that one of the ships in the skipjack class had had a partial subsafe program accomplished on it and they went to sea and they tried to blow the ship to the surface with the new EMBT blow system, emergency main ballast tank blow system and it came up from its depth like a leaf falling and it was going back and forth as it came up scaring everybody because it was like 45 degrees and so they went on at this time. Why and how are we going to correct that? So I got signed to go to sea on the Barbell, which was a diesel electric ship, but had a teardrop shaped hull, teardrop shaped hull, comparable to the skipjack class that had that experience. And we went out and played around with the blow system, and it was pretty obvious after a while that you had to blow the forward group first before you blew the after group. And in that way, you developed some dynamic stability as the ship came toward the surface. And so when they now operate what they call the chicken switches, which is the MBT blow system has two, two levers that the Right hand one, I guess, will do the, the, the forward group. The left hand one will do the back after group for the main ballast tank system. And so if you can get the bow up, and if you then blow the after system, you've got buoyancy forcing you to the surface. And the experiments showed that from about 400 feet, and you blew that system correctly, you could be on the surface in a matter of minutes, doing 12 knots 
from a dead stop. You know, it's, it's quite uh, reassuring to the crew to know that that went uh, well. I spent two years on subpack staff and then was assigned to the submarine desk in Washington. And on for that four years that I was in Washington, the first thing, I was in charge of uh, planning for the overhauls of 31 SSBN submarines such that they would be refueled and also equipped to fire the Poseidon missile. At that, in those days, the Polaris missile was a bottle-shaped missile that you'll see pictures of around. Uh, was the, had a limited range and they were trying to improve the range and the capacity of the missile. And so it required a larger space in the missile tubes and different connections and so forth, and so we were in charge of the contract with the electric boat company to make those design changes to accept the Poseidon missile. And then overall the plan for the overhaul of all 31 of them. And every one of those overhauls at that particular point, I think was, if I remember the right, was like $300 million. <clears throat> and so if you multiply $300 million by 31, the first 10 SSBNs were not large enough to do that, and so they just needed to be overhauled. And I was also in charge of one class, the Ethan Allen class, had five ships in the class, and I was in charge of their ongoing overhauls from the Washington point of view. And after four years there, I was assigned to the Charleston Naval Shipyard. And in Charleston, I was the repair officer. And the repair officer was in charge of most of the military people that were in the shipyard, that were all working as liaison between the crews of the and officers of the ships and the shipyard to make sure that things went well for the ships that had come in to be overhauled. And so I had that responsibility. The docking officer worked for me, and so every dry docking was of interest to me, and I usually showed up for those events and take the ship in and out of dry dock, which is kind of interesting because they have to have the blocks exactly prepared so when the ship sets down on them, it supports them evenly and there are no holes punched in the hull and so forth. So that was quite interesting. Um, I think the most interesting event that occurred during that period when I was a repair officer was we were overhauling the George Washington, which was the very first SSBN, uh, the very first ship that was outfitted with, in that case, Polaris missiles. And it was in our ship yard for overhauling. By that time, they had developed a technique at Mare Island to reconfigure all of the fittings for sill braised joints and criteria. And they were trying to correct some misaligned joints in the reactor compartment where the hydraulic lines that served the rest of the hydraulics of the ship were passing through the reactor compartment. And so there was an effort to cut bad joints out and put in new joints. And one night there was a grinder down there grinding on one of those joints. And he got down to the level they call the blue line where he was just about ready to break through. And hydraulic oil, turns out at 500 PSI, sprayed on him. Not only did it spray on him, but it sprayed on an electric heaters that were installed on the steam generators. Steam generators, huge boiler-like. There were two of them in the reactor compartment. And they had feet that were supposed to be movable. And they had seized up, and so they were heating those, those uh, joints up to free them up with electric heaters. And so that oil got on the heaters and caught in fire. And the guy, in the reactor compartment that was doing the grinding had sense enough to grab a fire extinguisher and put the fire out immediately. 
even though he was drenched with hydraulic water himself. And so that was a long night for us to figure out what had happened and to have it written up. And we really had to have on Admiral Rickover's desk the next morning a report of that and what we're going to do about it and how we're going to keep that from happening in the future. But what had happened was that they'd failed to bleed down that system. Uh, although they had declared that it was tagged out and run down. And so some people got disciplined in that process. And uh, that was probably the most exciting thing that happened to me during that period. After two years, I was promoted from the repair officer to, to be the production officer, which is immediately under the shipyard commander. And, uh, served as production officer for uh, about a six-month period and was also assigned back to Washington on the submarine desk again that I was in before but not in charge of the whole thing and so I was in charge of all non-nuclear submarine maintenance for all of the submarines in the, in the Pacific in the fleet uh, for four years and praise the Lord, and I give him credit, I didn't lose a submarine during the time I had that job. And I was required to certify that a submarine leaving an overhaul or leaving a new construction period was ready to go to sea. And so I signed out a number of messages that said, Mr. Com Sublanders, Tom said back, your submarine is certified to go to sea. And that was the subsafe program's quality control system that allowed us to, with audits, do that. And so for four years I had that job and uh, was assigned to the Bureau of Naval Personnel after that, where I was in Bupers, which was there in Washington at that time. Now it's out in Tennessee. <clears throat> but at that time, I was in charge of 1,250 engineering duty officers' assignments. People turn over every three years, so you have, you're working. And about one-third of 1,250 officers to assign them to different locations. And and the rule of Navy is the Navy needs are first, the uh, needs of the career for the officer are second, the needs of the family are third. And so in that job, I had to juggle those issues on an individual basis. And I, I enjoyed it because it was the near, nearest thing I could do to be to being a chaplain. A lot of times I told people that this process is so complicated and so difficult to control that the only one that's controlling it is God. And if you can rest in that, know that God knows what's going on, and He'll take care of you. But I guess I didn't tell that to everybody, but people I thought that would accept it, I did. And um, I guess the most, a lot of paperwork associated with that. If, you broke the rules that somebody's going to be overseas for a three-year tour with their family. You had to carry that broken rule all the way to the top of the Bureau of Naval Personnel, to the Vice Admiral that was in charge of the Naval Personnel. So you had to write a memo from me to my boss, and from him to his boss, and from his boss to the top level. So this turned out to be a folder that would unfold this way. And all these memos, I had to write them and just get people to sign them. And um, we had an officer in Yokosuka, Japan, assigned to the Navy repair effort there, which was considerable. And uh, the lieutenant commander and his wife came down with ovarian cancer. And the thought was the best place to get her uh, an operation for that would be at Bethesda in Maryland. And so this was in the fall. And so I had to move that family uh, from Yokosuka 
to Washington, D.C. for her operation. And it would be over Christmas, her recovery period would be. And so we wanted to get the family together with them. And to get that approved all the way up was quite a chore. But I was very happy to be able to do that. And get him relieved. I had to find somebody to go out there and relieve him, too. But, um, so I was in a position at that point so I could nominate myself to be the commander of the Charleston Naval Shipyard, which is what I really wanted to do. And so I did. And um, they approved of my assignment down there. And there was some politics associated with that. And I had good friends from my first tour down there that supported me with people like Strom Thurmond and, and Fritz Hollings, the two senators from South Carolina. And I think I had their approval, or I wouldn't have been assigned down there. So we were there for four years, lived in a beautiful house, which is run down in shambles right now. It's just a real sickening situation to go down there and see that house. It was so nice, and now it's just a wreck. But anyway, at, at Charleston, I was there for four years, overhauling and refueling nuclear submarines. And I can't remember, I think I saw the other day, the fact that we'd had 23 major availabilities during those four years, where we had both surface ships and, and submarines in there. And we usually hit them on time in cost to the degree that that's where my Legion of Merit came from, was the fact that we ran a pretty good shipyard. We uh, overhauled the Dale, which was a guided missile cruiser, in 11 months, I think, which was a month shorter than it was designed to do. And that was probably the biggest surface ship achievement that we had down there. But the submarine achievements were several, and every one of those refuelings is a chore. Um, for four years that I was there, we worked on an overhaul of the Narwhal. Narwhal was a one-of-a-kind submarine that had a reactor in it that was brand new. It was called a natural circulation reactor. They'd never refueled that, that reactor, even though they have a prototype of it in Idaho. That prototype hadn't run out of gas yet, but the Narwhal had to be refueled because it had run out of gas. But, so, first two years of my tour was getting ready for that overhaul, which was two years long, and took us two years to affect the overhaul and the refueling of the narwhal. And so that was uh, one of the achievements there that I was most proud of. We uh, had some problems. Uh, USS Ortolan was a submarine rescue vessel. One of two that exist in the Navy, did then, I don't know if they do now. But the Ortolan is a catamaran hull, two hulls. Each one has a recompression chamber in it. And so the design is such that you can lower divers down in a personnel transfer capsule, big crane certified crane on the ship to lower this 13-ton personnel capsule with maybe six divers in it to as deep as 600 feet, 650 feet. And they're supplied with a hydrogen uh, oxygen mix mixture. Nitrogen, oxygen, I'm really that. My memory is getting weak, but a special breathing mixture that would support divers at that depth. And when the ship came in, I sat down with the CO and I said, when you get through with this, are you going to be able to take the ship out and certify it to accomplish its job? No, we're not doing enough to do that. And I said, you mean, after we overhaul the ship, we send you out and the Navy needs you to rescue some submarines, you're not going to be able to do it. Yeah. So I made that known to Subland and to Washington. And Subland didn't want to spend the money on the ship. And 
So I was opposing a vice admiral on subland staff, <laughs> and I got to some admirals in Washington that, in effect, overhauled ruled him. Told us to do the work that was necessary to certify the ship. So the ship was in the shipyard for another year beyond its ordinary completion day and was on Sinkland Fleet's hit parade all that time. So um, that may be one reason I didn't make Admiral, <laughs> because I was stuck out to dry that way. But we did o finally overhaul the ship and do what was necessary to certify it. And in the process of doing that, we were testing the joint between the personnel transfer capsule, 13 tons, sitting on a huge machined joint, and held there in place with some clamps that were held together with lead screws on each side of the clamp. So you pull these clamps together, and that would take this tapered joint and pull it together. And in the process of testing it with 500 psi air underneath it in the recompression chamber on this huge disc, those clamps failed, flew pieces in all directions, launched a 13 ton personnel transfer up in the air and wham down on the ship. Nobody was hurt. We didn't have any casualties at all. And I heard the noise when I was going up my back step at my quarters, and I said, I know they're doing this. And I wonder what happened. Went down there, and that's what I found. So we had to figure out what we did wrong in that situation. And what we did wrong was to paint those surfaces. The design had depended on the coefficient of friction that's developed by bare metal as compared to epoxy paint, which we can put on them, and that was enough to overstress the clamps. So we had to redesign the camp clamps, and we had to insist that everybody keep that, those surfaces clean. But it took us a while to figure that out. But anyway, that's what happened there. But these are kind of exciting times that uh, we got involved in. And look back on it that the Lord protected me again in that shipyard situation. I didn't have any deaths. We got a safety award for our category of, of industry from the national safety people. All four years I was there and we had nobody killed in the process of all the cranes and scaffolding and and the other things that go on in, a, in an activity like that that are just staggering in their uh, complexity and also in their uh, importance. Uh, for example, bringing in a, a nuclear core to replace uh, and refuel a reactor, you have to inspect all of the train tracks and the train cars and make sure that all of that's okay when you bring this thing in. The crane has to be up to smooth, uh, up to all the specifications and has to be tested recently. And crane operators have to be carefully trained and so forth. So in the old days, they used to refuel a reactor by taking out each core unit separately and then replacing it one control unit, there about that square, probably as high as this room, uh, and have the fissionable material in that. And so there's a lot more potential for accidents when you're doing it that way. And so they developed a technique where they replace the whole thing all at once, but it's a big lift. And big heavy lift. But that's maturation of that whole process occurred while I was there. But uh, so Ruth and I left the shipyard in 1982 and came here and I started school 
and got a PhD here. And in the middle of getting the PhD, I went out to Southern Wesleyan and started teaching. Awesome. Uh, got any questions? <laughs> oh, honestly, no. I think you did a really good job describing uh, mm -hmm. your career, and it's extremely impressive. And mm -hmm. Really glad that I had the opportunity to interview you, and I'm mm -hmm. also thankful for uh, you serving our country and all that you've done. Yeah. Well, the Lord was gracious, that's all I can say. I received Christ as Savior when I was enlisted, and uh, that was probably the most important thing in my life. And then my marriage after that. I married to a wonderful lady. Congratulations. Thank you.